Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and as always, I am your host through this hour of incredibly fascinating information and conversation. At least I hope you'll find it that way. Um, every so often we do one in a series we call Voices of Our Lives, and this is one of those days. And today my guest is former State Senator Roy Ashburn, long-standing public servant, a Republican, who made some headlines not too long ago by coming out. So we wanted to interview him and have you see just what's been on his mind and kind of what's been in his life. Roy, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you. Of course. I mean, we had a uh, long time serving together in the California legislature, and I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I definitely enjoyed our time together <laughs> serving in the legislature. Well, let me start sort of further back than people usually do, because uh, they just want to talk about things that just happened. But I kind of like to know what is it that leads a person through their lives and what their lives have been like. So if you don't mind, start kind of from the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Born in Long Beach, raised on the Central Coast in San Luis Obispo County. And then uh, after high school, went to Bakersfield uh, for a job and uh, worked there for a good long time. And then for the last 14 years, uh, Bakersfield and Sacramento, close to the state capitol. So in your childhood, what, uh, what were your folks doing? What was their work? My dad worked for the Union Oil Company at the refinery at Wilmington, and then later transferred up to Santa Maria. He was always with Union Oil Company and uh, always with the refineries. Mom was a typical, was mine too. <laughs> typical uh, uh, housekeeper. Uh -huh. And uh, I had two brothers, uh, uh -huh. four years older and four years younger. Uh -huh. And so a fairly traditional, typical California family. And um, I think when we were talking earlier, now that we're talking about your having come out and your um, sort of your life uh, as a gay man in the closet and not in the closet, Talk a little bit about your childhood. Did you have a sense that you might be gay early on? I did, but I don't think for, I think at young ages, people have feelings, mm -hmm. but don't know what they are. Right. And don't know how to express them or to, so I knew there was something different. Mm -hmm. I can remember uh, trying to kiss a boy mm -hmm. on the playground in the third grade. Mm -hmm. I remember in the fifth grade um, maybe being taunted mm -hmm. uh, and I actually was, there was a boy that, that, uh, that got physical with me uh, in, in, the, in the boys room at school. Uh, not physical in a, in a provocative way but he was trying to hurt me. In a me. hurting way. Uh -huh. He was trying to hurt me. So, you know, I wasn't uh, articulating um, being different, but maybe people were perceiving it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I knew that there was something different. And um, it was, uh, speaking for my generation, which is sort of around yours, I think I'm probably a little older, but um, it was not a good thing to realize in yourself, kind of a scary thing. Were there messages that you had gotten about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing or just generally? I don't have recollections of having a sense of right and wrong or good or bad about it. It's just that I knew that there was something different, but not so different that in high school I dated a, a girl for the mm -hmm. last uh, two years, we were steady mm -hmm. boy and girlfriend in high school. And then after high school, um, I dated a girl that I had gone through school with, and uh, it was a pretty passionate romance, you mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. So there may have been feelings there, but, but then, you know, um, I was doing things that I guess you would be expected to do. Right, and it's kind of like, I, I do understand entirely, it's not really a rejection, it's almost like I don't even want to go there. I don't right. want to think about that. But I remember you told me a story about one of your teachers. Right. This memory 
is so strong even to this day in the sixth grade. Now that's a long time ago. Uh -huh. One of our teachers at the school that was, uh, was part of a group of men who were in the sand dunes near Pismo Beach and they were arrested mm -hmm. uh, for, for their activity and they were labeled as homosexuals, as gay. Mm -hmm. And the word went through the community and through the school and I can remember the taunts and the put downs and the ridicule and, and that struck me in a way that for, for always I remember that if you acknowledge that you're gay, if you acknowledge that you're different in that way, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be labeled a pervert, a, uh, a dangerous person, uh, you know, some kind of a sexual deviant, because those are the words that were being associated with one of our teachers who happened to be a part of that, that group of men that were arrested. Um, I, I, that memory has stayed with me uh, always. Well, it would be a pretty powerful message that that was not something that you wanted to A, B, or B, admit about yourself. Um, well, especially since at the age of eight, I realized, now one of my revelations, that I wanted to be a politician. Uh -huh. it, it was not a, uh, a subtle thing. It was a passion that I was interested in, government and politics, and I wanted that for my life. And so I ran for every school office. I was a volunteer, even riding my bicycle to the campaign headquarters uh, when I was eight years old and 10 years old and 12 years old. I, Ronald Reagan ran for governor of California, came to my town in San Luis Obispo County at the very beginning of his campaign. And because I was 12 years old, I had the honor of greeting him when he stepped off the bus, the very first person. That was the life I wanted, a very public life. And then I knew there was something different. And then this event occurred at the school where if you were different in that way, that was not going to be acceptable. Right, and you could kiss your career goodbye. I mean, well, it, it didn't matter in those days, even Republican or Democrat. It was, it was pretty serious. Uh, that uh, this was just not going to be the thing that you wanted to be. But, but you, of course, have been a Republican all your life. I was born a Republican. <laughs> my I mom, can see that, Roy, from the minute mom, I met you. My mom and dad were not registered to vote. There were no family members active in politics. We had one aunt who was in the Republican Women's Club in Long Beach. I'm up in Pismo Beach. That's a long distance, and I didn't know this aunt very well. So I don't know what the origin of my Republican uh, leanings are, but it's real. And so I, I took mom and dad in 1966 to the campaign office of Ronald Reagan and had them register as Republicans so that they could vote in that election. Uh, my family was not political, um, th but for whatever reason, it, that was my passion. So where did you, uh, after high school, where'd you go? After high school, I had the opportunity to uh, go to Bakersfield and actually work for the Republican campaigns in 1972. They had a one paid position to coordinate the volunteers, do the voter registration and that sort of thing. And at age 18, I was hired by the Republicans. So I made the big move from the coast in San Luis Obispo to Bakersfield. And uh, so that was, that was amazing. I got paid to do what I had always wanted to do. And that was the beginning of my political life because after that, I went to work for a county supervisor as a field representative. And then after that, uh, for a, the, a new uh, US congressman as his local representative. And uh, then I ran for the county board of supervisors myself. Did you uh, go to college? I delayed college for five years after high school. Um, I married uh, a woman uh, at age 23. Huh. And so there, there was uh, 
well, something happened right after high school that uh, changed my life in a profound way. Will you talk about that? I, I will. Um, I met this girl in high school and we had gone through school together. And after uh, graduation, she went to San Jose to college and I went to Bakersfield to work for the Republicans, but a fast and furious romance developed. And uh, we dated a couple months and uh, made a trip to Los Angeles and on the way back up the coast uh, I had a terrible car accident and uh, only my car involved I was the driver uh, but uh, my girlfriend was killed mm -hmm. in that accident and that changed my life uh, and and really sent me into what I guess we call today a depression sure um, in those days you didn't go to psychiatrists or therapists, you just kind of suffered. And I became extraordinarily withdrawn for five years. Mm. Uh, I didn't date, I didn't go out, I went to work and I went home and I drank. Mm -hmm. And that was my life for five years until I met the girl who then I married and she became my wife uh, for the next 26 years. And you had children, and she had a child already? She had one child already, and then we had three together, three daughters, and so four daughters total, and um, a very, very public life, because elected uh, at age 29 to the County Board of Supervisors, and then from that 12-year uh, service to the State Assembly, for the next six years and then eight years in the state senate. A, a very public life, um, but by then, you, the realization that, you know, yes, I'm gay, but also the, the, the terror that I would be found out, that somehow somebody would perceive it. And in my own twisted thinking, that there was no way me believing there was no way that I could be gay and be elected, especially from Bakersfield, California. And, uh, and your party by then, uh, because I was there when you were there, and we started in the Democratic Party electing, I'll say, a few. I mean, you know, the LGBT caucus has never been very big, big. although we had a caucus after a while. Yeah. It was just me for a while. Um, but still, the signals that we got were difficult enough, and I think in the Republican Party it was becoming more and more of a sort of a wedge issue that was being used, right. which must have made it even more terrifying. It, it was, and I don't think that, I'm not sure that any of us realized what was happening to the Republican Party at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 1980s, when the new Western conservatives had uh, finally achieved the prominence in the Republican Party. Barry Goldwater, mm -hmm. William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan. And I really, but that was the, my Republican Party. People who believed in individual freedom, that, uh, that people uh, are responsible for themselves and that government ought to have a limited role and government shouldn't be involved in what happens in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. But then, beginning in the 70s and certainly growing in the 80s, was the religious right mm -hmm. moving in and becoming a part of, and you could say, you know, taking over the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Well, the religious right have a definite view about homosexuality, mm -hmm. and it is a, uh, a view that it is wrong uh, from a moral and a spiritual basis, and condemned by God, and and that then drove the Republican Party uh, away from this idea of individual liberty and freedom uh, to more of a condemnation if you were different. Well, it seemed to me also, in my cynical uh, opinion, to be a pretty good organizing principle, a fundraising principle. I mean, if you can whip up an enemy, it's kind of like you can get a lot of people who are going to church every Sunday, you know, in these more sort of fundamentalist arenas to think, well, that's the party for me because they hate the same people I hate. Right. 
And, uh, well, it it's always was a easier tool. to be against right. something than to be for it. And to put somebody down because of who they are is certainly going to draw an audience. And well, uh, that me, did happen. Let me go back for a minute to sort of connect some of these things as well, because this is the part that I, I want to explore greatly, of course, in terms of sort of the current situation, yours and politics. But um, you mentioned the, the accident, and it had a, 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 a terrible impact on you in terms of five years of feeling really isolated. Um, but you, you probably didn't lose that feeling of isolation. I'm not certain. No. I know you were devoted to your wife and your family. I mean, this, I, we could see it, those of us who know you. Um, but still, there would be an isolation, the part that has to be hidden uh, the inauthenticity mm -hmm. in a way. So did the sort of the impact of that accident, would you say it, it, it lasted longer than, than these five years? Well, I think it added to mm -hmm. the fear and the isolation mm -hmm. and the compartmentalizing of a life. To be, to be one thing in your knowledge of yourself mm -hmm. and to be portraying yourself as something else. Mm -hmm. uh, my great regret, looking back now, is that I was dishonest mm -hmm. and that I was deceitful and that I did use people. I used my ex-wife, I used my children, I used my family, I used my friends, I used my constituents. In the promotion of my career and my desire to be in public service, but and driven by this incredible fear that somehow I might be found out. I wanted to be this public servant. I think my goals and my motives were right. They were good in the service that I wanted to provide, but my means of getting to that service was, de it was deceitful. And I, that's, I have a tremendous regret about that. Well, it must have been complicated too by what happened with your brother, your younger brother. Right. W would you be willing to speak about that? Sure. Well, my younger brother, uh, Dale, was gay and uh, he died of AIDS 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was extraordinarily painful uh, for, uh, for obviously for him and, and for those of us who loved him, it, it was excruciating for mom and dad. Uh, they, it was a struggle for them to understand what was happening to Dale and how and why. And, um, it was sudden for them to find out too. I mean, it, I, I'm not certain what their experience yeah. was, but in so many places early on when people died of AIDS, their family had no idea they were gay right. and suddenly had to deal with the whole thing all at once. Well, Dale had a partner, uh -huh. even though he was very young, uh, had a partner, but in mom and dad's world, they were roommates. Mm -hmm. They were two guys who were friends and shared the same apartment and bought a house together later. Mm -hmm. um, we never talked about it. Right. Even, even my brother and I never talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. When he got sick, of course, you know, we knew why, mm -hmm. because this was an incredible scourge uh, mm -hmm. that hit especially hard um, uh, on male homosexuals at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Dale was, lived in such agony. The, the medical complications and 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 all and and then the the impact on the family it was and so here I am in public office pretending to be a straight man with a family voting against gay rights and I have a brother who's gay whom I love dearly who's dying and I'm doing things that are hurtful to him and hurtful to me and hurtful to other gay people. It, it was terrible. 
and I am so sorry. I, I, there are no words to express how well, sorry I am. I really understand, and I think I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure there are some of my viewers right now going, well, you should have had more courage, Roy. Should have had more courage. But I want to say, it's really easy for other people to say, and everyone comes to it at their same moment. I mean, for you to say you were using your family, I, my, my experience and my observation is that you're now being very hard on yourself, which is fine, because you want to be very honest about what you were doing. Um, and very difficult, but what happened with your family? I mean, they came to know or suspect or something after a while. Well, I mean, after so many years, I guess I reached a point where, and I never had a conscious moment of decision that, well, I'm, I'm going to start moving toward coming out. But, but I was doing it in my actions and, you know, I was doing things and going places that I would never have thought about for the fear of being discovered. It's a little more risky behavior going risky to behavior. gay bars or gay bars and sneaking into San into Las Vegas Pride and mm -hmm. San Diego Pride and hiding in the crowd, mm -hmm. um, drinking, uh, you, you know, using alcohol in very unhealthful ways, mm -hmm. um, risky behavior seems like a, sometimes it's a kind of a way of hoping that you get found out. I, I mean... Well, uh, I think ultimately that's what happened because uh, after all, the night I was arrested for driving under the influence, I had left a gay bar in downtown Sacramento at two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. after having been at the Miss Latino drag queen competition that night. <laughs> um, it was a pretty good show, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but uh, when, you know, driving those few blocks uh, in downtown Sacramento and seeing the red lights in the rearview mirror, uh, I knew, I knew my life was over. Uh, I really believed it was over. Um, I, you know, I now know that it was the beginning of a new life. A much better life, a life of honesty and truthfulness. And so I apologize sincerely for my drunk driving and using alcohol and driving and putting people at risk in that way. Uh, I really am terribly sorry about that. Um, but I, I am so relieved to uh, now finally be truthful about who I am and and to be able to say to people that I hurt, uh, my family, my friends, people who supported me and trusted me, uh, and to gay people for the votes I cast, the speeches I made, the things I did that were hurtful. Um, I, I regret it deeply, uh, and I'm not going to be that way ever again. Well, you're, um, you're, on behalf of all gay people in the universe, I forgive you, Roy. Thank you. I don't know if all gay people in the universe do forgive you, actually. Well, it's just that... I can understand why people would have a difficult time forgiving me. Well, you know, they have some choices and they may stay completely pissed off at you. I mean, I have mm -hmm. no idea. But you had... Your daughters knew a while ago. Is that, right. Is that right? Because I know you went through a divorce before right. all of this happened. Right. Uh, my ex-wife and I divorced and... Um, the, my daughters were told at that time that I was gay. By someone else, not by you? Not by me. Uh -huh. And so they've known. Mm -hmm. That's another of my regrets, is that for, the, for six years, my kids had the burden of keeping my secret. Mm -hmm. That's a burden no father should ever put on his so children. So six years between the divorce and when they between, were told between the and divorce the arrest for drunk driving. And when I finally came out on March the 8th of 2010. So here you are with the red lights in your rearview mirror. You've oh. had too much to drink. You've come in from a gay bar and a drag show in Sacramento and the Sacramento with police With an unidentified male in the front seat of a of state course. vehicle. Right. 
um, I can only imagine what's going through your mind, but what happens then that night, the next day, and the next day? Uh, well, the one thing I wanted, the one decision I made then was that I wanted to be treated as any other person would be treated, not as a special character. And I believe I was treated in that way. And so I spent a long night in jail. And then um, I, I snuck home. Mm -hmm. um, the media was already on it. Mm -hmm. uh, rumors were already flying about obviously a state senator being arrested for drunk driving is news. Well, where was he? Mm -hmm. What was he doing that night? And so the rumors were already out there about, uh, about being at a gay club that night. So for the next three or four days, uh, I was home alone uh, in the back bedroom of my house because the TV cameras were all si lined up on the sidewalk out front. My doorbell was being rung every half hour by the news media trying to get me to say something. Um, and for during that several day period of time, I made a decision that um, that it was over, the dishonesty was over, and from, and I was going to be honest, and I was going to tell the truth, and I was going to come out, and that I would be truthful, totally truthful and honest about everything from that point forward. And so uh, then I decided, I did, the decision I had to make was how to come out. Right. Well, if I figured if I'm going to come out, I don't want to do it subtly. <laughs> no. So I picked a uh, very popular radio talk show in Bakersfield, California, hosted by a very, very conservative radio talk show host. Uh -huh. And so at 9.15 in the morning on March the 8th, I called the radio show and, uh, and I said the words mm. that I am gay. And what was the response from the conservative host? Um, well, she actually conducted a pretty good interview, I thought. Uh -huh. and, um, and was uh, it a call-in show? It, it was. <laughs> well, I was on for 15 minutes. There were no callers. <laughs> <laughs> I think people were uh, shocked. Were shocked. Uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe too shocked to dial the phones. But um, anyway, that's the way I came out, and of course, it made news not just in oh, yeah, California but all over the world. And then you had to, there were two things I want to ask. One is you had to go back to work. Yes. I don't think people quite understand what it's like to be a state assembly member or a state senator. You all work together in one room. That's right. You know, the floor. Right. And there's only 40 senators. So right. here are 40 senators. I was already termed out. And you go back and here's your guys from your caucus who are not the most affectionate of gay people, I mean for gay people, and my guys, none of whom wanted to go over and hug you because mm -hmm. they were afraid that all the news would be, you know, Democrats embrace Roy Ashburn. Yeah. Um, so what was it like walking onto that floor? Well, uh, you're a big part of that story because as I understand it, you had been out of the Senate for more than a year. Right. I was just back visiting that and day. And you had come back that day, uh, maybe not even knowing about- I had no idea. What had transpired no with, idea. with me. I knew you'd had a car crash. So I came in to the room and the TV cameras were lined up- Inside uh, the floor. Uh, waiting to catch every moment of right. my arrival. I know I walked on the floor and Chris Kehoe, also a, a, a lesbian senator, uh, said to me, don't go over and hug Roy. They just, they want to get that picture. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, wh I've never had a car crash. And, you know, I mean, I don't know what that's about. I had no idea. Well, you and I did hug. And uh, that hug um, meant more to me than almost anything. Uh, I needed it at that moment. And I couldn't, uh, I, that morning I had come out on the radio. I had no voice. There, 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 
yes, I could speak, but there were no words. Mm -hmm. You were my voice that day. Well, it was interesting, Roy. I mean, it just goes to show you things you don't know. I walked off the floor still not knowing you had come out. I had no idea. And I walk off the floor, and there's an area next to the floor where you walk out to the hallway called the gate, where people are not allowed on the floor. They wait there for you. And I walk out to a gaggle of cameras and microphones, all, you know, right in my face, saying, what do you think about Roy or Ashburn coming out? And I, I, I must have looked totally stunned, and I said, Roy Ashburn came out? And then they started asking, well, how do you feel about a man that voted against gay rights and a bit, a bit, a bit? And all I could think to say was that if you're ashamed of who you are, of course you don't think your whole group should have any rights, which is really all I said about 15,000 times, you know, but I was happy to be your voice without even knowing that's what was going on well, that day. The compassion that you showed and the uh, understanding that you were willing to extend was remarkable. and I appreciate it more than uh, I can ever say. Well, we're even more family now than we've ever yeah, been, absolutely. aren't we? But you also had to go to court. I mean, there must have been something that came out of the crash. Well, I shouldn't there call was it a crash. No crash. It was just a no. you know, drunk driving. Yeah. Sorry. No, there was. I kept thinking that there was some, you know, no, big Of all thing, the bad no. things that could have happened, <laughs> fortunately, there was no crash. Sorry, you were just pulled over. No, I was pulled. I, I actually was only a, a few blocks from the gay club in downtown Sacramento at 2.05 in the morning. So there was hardly any traffic and, you know, the highway patrol had pulled behind me for a couple blocks and had seen that I was weaving and, uh -huh. and pulled me over. So I did the things that every first time drunk driver does with the court system. I paid the fines, I went to traffic school, I went to Mothers Against Drunk Driving class. Um, I found AA and uh, have been very active with Alcoholics Anonymous since. Um, I, uh, I regret deeply uh, driving and under the influence. It's a very irresponsible thing to do. So tell me about your life now. I mean, here you are, you've come out in Bakersfield Radio right. and you're termed out of the Senate. Right. Um, at the end of last year, right. um, and you're in recovery, and you're out. I am. So what is life like? Life is amazing. It really is amazing. People have been very, very kind. Uh, I think people would be surprised maybe by my colleagues in the legislature, the Republicans. Uh, I think people would expect the Democrat members to be kind <laughs> Some and of us aren't nice understanding. Too, but, you know. <laughs> but the Republican members have been wonderful with me as well. And the, the truth is that nearly everyone has someone close to them who's gay. Mm -hmm. A family member, of the son or daughter of a close friend, a close friend, a neighbor. And so it's pretty hard, really, when you pull back the theatrics and sort of the expected, and it's just people to people. You know, it's kind of hard to keep up the, the put down and the hatred. And so I saw that with my Republican colleagues, and I'm, you know, I'm happy about that. Honesty is incredibly liberating. And so, no longer being in fear, being totally truthful and honest in all aspects of my life uh, has been wonderful and transforming. And I now want to do everything I can to try to advance equal rights, total equality under the Constitution and under our laws for gay people. No one should be discriminated against, especially in the United States of America, no one. And so as a Republican, and as a Republican who was elected to public office, when I left the Senate, I was the only out Republican elected state official in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what a rarity 
uh, a Republican gay out person is, mm -hmm. that maybe by speaking out and saying, especially to the Republicans, there's a hypocrisy. The Republican Party says, first and foremost, the party of individual liberty, the party of freedom, except for gay people. Now, wait a minute. Right. That is not an acceptable contradiction. That is not an acceptable hypocrisy. And so I want to face that directly on, and, and to challenge uh, those who profess to lead our party, uh, that that is not an acceptable position. And I think Republicans will be, uh, will be uh, maybe surprised to learn that if on this issue they would be true to what the party professes, that uh, more people would be willing to give the Republican Party a second look. Well, it's interesting to me because your colleagues, as you said, and my former colleagues, um, were good about it, were welcoming to you, were not castigating you right. or, uh, you know, throwing you out of the caucus or whatever. And yet, I'll bet you dimes to donuts, as my grandmother used to say, that this year on the floor they'll still be making oh, absolutely. homophobic speeches right. or voting against gay rights. That's right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those contradictions that I've seen. Right. I had the same thing in the Democratic Party when I first brought the gay student bill. There were eight Democrats who had been elected who were from districts like your district in Bakersfield a little bit, but they were Democrats being elected from, you know, Central Valley, right. et cetera. And they absolutely could not vote for any gay people. They just couldn't do it because they were afraid. I mean, there's all kinds of fear, Roy, right. isn't there? Well, fear, fear rules. Fear rules in the actions that that many of us take. And so, you know, when when you uh, when you do, when you're not true to yourself, when you know you're doing something, you're casting a vote that you know is not right, but you're doing it because fear of retaliation or fear of not being elected, mm -hmm. um, that's not leadership. Mm -hmm. And you know, having been there, as you have been there, we have a responsibility. And I think that's, I mean, take a look at where we are in our national political scene today. Right. Isn't that what people are asking for from our political leaders? Is the honesty and the, and the truthfulness and being straightforward about the problems that confront us? Now, I guess politicians will always be, you know, maybe a little fearful of, of their electorate in, um, you know, wanting to toe the line in order to, to get reelected. I tried to get away with that excuse, by the way. The day I came out, one of the things that the radio talk show host asked me was, well, will you continue voting as you have been voting um, on gay rights issues? And I said, yes, because my responsibility is to vote the way my constituents would have me vote. Well, I come, Bakersfield, California, that area of Cal is a very conservative area. And you take a look at the you know, gay marriage issue that's been on the ballot, Prop 22, and then in Prop 8, and probably of all the areas of the state, the highest percentage of vote against gay marriage. So, you know, not just in what we would believe the, the uh, public opinion to be, but actually reflected in the votes that have been cast, right. uh, it's that way. But the position that I articulated then is not acceptable because when it comes to, to the rights that each of us have under the Constitution, those rights require elected officials to stand up and fight. And so that's where I had it wrong. It's not acceptable to go along with even the prevailing view is we might interpret it within our community if it has to do with somebody's rights being trampled upon 
or people being held back because they're not they're not uh, fulfilling their full rights uh, in our society. And so that, I corrected myself on that one, and, and I believe it that we each have a duty and a responsibility, not just, not just to, to feel it inside, but to say it and to fight for it, uh, because our rights are next. Well, I think um, it, it's been an amazing journey for you, and I think that many of the people who have criticized you for um, what they would call hypocrisy mm -hmm. uh, as you went along, knowing pretty much that you were gay but being too afraid, uh, I think that people forget their own journeys. They may have taken place earlier in their lives, but there's always a journey about coming out. There's always a journey. Now, many people who are quite young now maybe growing up in an atmosphere where they don't feel the same fear. Right. They're not overcoming the fear, necessarily. They're not having to face as much of it, depending right. on where they grow up. But everybody feels this fear with their family. Right. You know, will I lose my family if I come out? Will I lose my job if I come out? It's still a dangerous time. And so what I see when I look at your, you know, your history is the same journey, simply culminated very recently, and one in which you've had to explore as a grown-up what you went through all along the way. So how do you, um, how do you communicate this to other people? Um, you know, in the party, for instance, mm -hmm. or other people that are thinking of running. H how do you get this message out about honesty? Because you're, you know, you've woken up and now you're honest, and we're happy to have you in the honest camp, but how, what do you tell them if they, if they say to you, Roy, I can't do this now? Well, I say what I said a moment ago, is that if you're going to be in leadership in the Republican Party, you have an obligation to two things. One, to not be hypocritical in saying that the Republican Party believes in individual liberty and then saying, well, except for gays, which is the current party position. Right. And secondly, that all of us in leadership positions have an obligation to fight for equal rights for every American. And what do you think about the conversation they've been having about the military uh, in terms of uh, don't ask, don't tell? Well, I mean, this is an issue that is, well, I'm happy with the vote. And you saw that eight Republican senators uh, when it finally was a straight up vote on eliminating don't ask, don't tell and allowing gays to openly serve in the military, eight Republican United States senators stood up and said, yes, equal rights. Um, I, I think that's, I think that's a, 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 I think it's a very good um, sign for a change within the Republican Party. Um, I wish there were, had been more. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke on the Senate floor in favor of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Mm -hmm. You know, Barry Goldwater was, in 1964, nominated to lead the Republican Party as the presidential candidate. He was a United States senator from the state of Arizona. Um, <laughs> And his view about gays serving in the military was so straightforward, even back to 19, into the, to the mid-1960s, that this is an issue that we need to get over, you yeah. know, that there are gay people, and there are gay people serving in the military, and they're doing a great job. And anyone who would put their life on the line in service to their country ought to be celebrated, and certainly they ought to be treated equally. Well, he's the one, apparently, who said, I don't care if they are straight, I just care if they can shoot straight. Shoot straight. And also he has a gay grandson. Do you think that might have um, gone into his thinking a little bit? I think bit? it does. I think having <coughs> openly gay family members does affect because, again, members of our family are the people we love and we know the best. And we're born straight and we're born gay. and. It's a reality that people need to accept that we are different. We are different people. 
and um, but that all people in our country are entitled to equal rights. It's complicated, though. It it's is complicated, complicated for a family. It's complicated for sure an individual. Um, so what kind it's of complicated uh, by generational understandings? <coughs> I mean, I was very fearful of telling my mom. I imagine people watching this show have had that same thought in their coming out, that at some point you've got to tell mom. And for me, you know, my brother was gay. And it kept running through my mind, how am I ever going to tell mom that I'm gay? Because mom's going to feel like somehow there might be something wrong with her. Hmm with not just one gay son, but two gay sons, that maybe she's defective in some way. Mm. Well, that's a burden I didn't want to put on my mom, but as I know people have experienced in their own coming out experiences, when I finally did tell mom, and I had to hurry and tell her because it was coming on the news after my de drunk driving arrest, I had to get ahead of the the mobile home park uh, <laughs> neighbors telling her. Right. Uh, so I couldn't do it face to face. I had to do it over the phone. Uh, Mom was wonderful. And she said, well, I don't care what you are. You know, I love you no, no matter what. And she probably had an inkling. Well, and I've said that to so many friends since who are struggling is that, you know, well, geez, I, I don't want to tell my parents. And what I say is they already know. Well, I mean, the, the so-called glass closet. I mean, when I decided I had to tell my parents, I was 40. And I had pretty much known I was a lesbian since I was, you know, 17, but I was in the closet as well. Yeah. Talk about public life, I was on television. And uh, when I finally wanted to tell my parents, I invited them over to coffee, and it took me about four weeks to make that cup of coffee in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, and my parents are going, honey, do you need some help with the coffee? <laughs> Uh, when I finally came out and with the coffee, I also came out and my mother said, took my hand and she patted it and she said, it's okay, honey, we always knew you liked girls better. Boom, you know, and yeah. I'm 40. Right. Could you have told me this when I was 20? But yeah. of course it was my responsibility, not theirs. They just stand there, you know, right. patiently waiting for you to come out of the closet pretty much. Or, you know, when you're as old as we were coming out to them, they've got a lot invested in you too. They don't want to give you up, but it's still scary. It is very scary. And you can see in very real ways how difficult it is for young people with the suicides that we've just witnessed uh, and, the, and the bullying and the tormenting and the taunting that even today is going on. Uh, young people today have it I guess, you know, I'm, I can say they have it easier than I did um, in, a, in an earlier, less accepting time. But even now, it, the, the put downs, the ta taunting, the bullying is going on and it has a profound effect on people, even to the extent that a young person would, would take their own life. I mean, that's, that's a horrible thing. So how do you plan to sort of use this new feeling and information? I mean, I've never seen you so happy. I've never seen you so relaxed. Um, I'm a big fan of honesty too, and I can just see in you that it, it simply, it's like a burden that's, that's removed. Right. Now, how do you pass that on? You said people have been asking you about right. stuff. Well, I want to make myself available. I want to speak out. Um, I want. To, I'm writing a book, um, and I want to. And my book is not just my life story, um, a public life, and a big secret, mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to to reconcile those two. But also, the to challenge politics and the and some of the and the Republican Party and this contradiction as I call it mm -hmm. um, I mean we just need to get over it and uh, and if I can be helpful in in telling 
you know, my story and, and acknowledging what I did that was harmful and hurtful for gay people. Uh, but then to say, you know, you know, I, I'm going to do everything I can to make up for it. And do you find any kind of opening at all in the party to listen? Well, yes, actually. I mean, there are organizations that um, are working very hard to get the message out and to try to uh, communicate with elected officials, uh, Democrat and Republican. Um, I had the opportunity to speak recently in Washington, D.C. at uh, at the conference for one of these groups. Can you imagine me, a, a gay <laughs> Republican, going and speaking to a gay organization in Washington, D.C.? But, but I, was, I'm, I was glad to do it and, and, and relieved by the reaction. Uh, you know, after people say, you know, I wasn't very happy with you. You're right. You had every reason to be unhappy with me and what I did. But join me now and help me now because maybe I can speak to Republicans. Maybe I can reach some people that we couldn't reach before. And uh, that's what I want to do. And um, you're, you have a good relationship with your daughters too, don't you? Oh, they're the best. I mean, yeah, I, I know you always <laughs> smile so much when you talk about them. Oh, yeah. But that must have felt risky too. I mean, we all feel like, I wonder whether I'm going to have a family yeah. left after this all happens. Well, I just have such regret, again, for putting them in the position of being the keeper of dad's secret. That's a, that's a burden that no child should ever have to bear for a parent. And I did that. And so I'm very sorry, and I've apologized to each of my daughters. and. And uh, they've forgiven me, and um, they're they're amazing. Um, I love them with all my heart. So, what plans for the future, Roy? I mean, you it might be a little more difficult being an elected public servant these days, although we don't know right. how the times might change. But what do you think about for the future? Well, I don't know. I I love public service. I know you do. Again, at age eight. For no apparent reason, I was infected by the political virus, and so, and I've had a wonderful opportunity to serve, and I want to continue, and Governor Schwarzenegger has made it possible for me to continue by appointing me to a very significant board that has to do with unemployment insurance and disability insurance for the workers of California and for the employers and their interest. And so I'm looking forward to that service. But who knows, I may want to run for office again. And, uh, and I may want to run for office in a very conservative part of California. And I have a feeling that if I run with total honesty and speak directly to the issues that affect the lives of people in our communities and in California and in our country, I might just win. Well, you know, it's a funny thing because, as you said earlier, people look at politicians and they're very upset, mostly about the lies, That's right. about hypocrisy, about right. whatever. Just tell me, you know, the truth. Who are so, you? What do you believe in? Exactly. I, if I want to vote for you, I want to vote for the person that's really there. And what I found when I ran, because as you might imagine, since no gay person had ever gotten through a primary, um, I was a little concerned about the honesty, and yet it turned out to give me a reputation doing nothing else but coming out for honesty and courage, which is, of right. course, two things we want people to think we have. Exactly. So um, with a few minutes left in the show, how would you sum up really your kind of message to the people watching the show out of all of this life, this the Sturm und Drang, the uh, overcoming it, and the, and the place that you're in now, the very good place. What would your message be to people watching the show? Well, my hope is that everyone will find that place of peace that comes from honesty and that we would be accepting and loving to one another. Um, that's not asking too much. That each of us are wonderful, 
complex individuals, and we're so privileged to live in this great country. And the, the cornerstone of the greatness of America is the freedom that we have, the freedom to be who we are. And so if we can be who we are without fear that somebody else is gonna put us down or that we won't have the same right that our neighbor would have, uh, and if there's some way that I can help to bring people to a greater level of honesty and acceptance and, um, uh, and, and to, fully, uh, to, to fully live that American ideal of freedom, um, that would be a great thing. Roy, thank you so much for being with us today and thank you. being where you are and who you are and um, really glad that you decided to do the show. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And, and thank I, you for joining us, too. Uh, remember, you are who you are for a reason, so get used to it.